Hi, Alan Stratton from Aswood Turns. Last week, Tim Yoder put out a video in which, which he entitled Spheres for Dummies. And his premise was that he had found a sphere jig that was perfect, that even he could turn a sphere with that sphere jig. Now, I have a lot of respect for people who can design jigs because they are essential in many aspects of wood turning. However, when it comes to turning a sphere, no jig is required. In fact, many jigs require more work than a simple process that I will show you in this video. The only specialized tools that I have used is this faceplate, which has been hollowed out into a somewhat of a cup. And if you can see closer, it has been a little bit worse for wear because I've been using it for a very long time. This goes on my headstock. Everyone has a live center. The only thing I've done differently is to find a rubber stopper, drill it out, and put it on there to shield the point. End of specialized tools. You can use gouges, you can use scrapers, you can use any other tools that you please. And this process is adaptable to anyone and without the expense of buying a jig. So let's turn these spheres, perfect spheres, out of plumb with no specialized jig. Turning a sphere is easier done than said. I will explain the process two ways before doing any cutting. Let's begin with the end in mind. A sphere in two dimensions is a circle. A cylinder is a rectangle. Our lathe will rotate the two-dimensional figure into three-dimensional object. From geometry, we know that a circle and square share key characteristics. The diameter of a circle is the same as both the length and the width of a square. The question now is how to transition between the two figures. Let us do this by cutting corners. The red line is a tangent to the circle. Then cut the corner on the other side. At this point our lathe would take care of cutting the corresponding corners. Our target circle is there. It is inscribed in what is now called an octagon. Hence, the process we are following is called the octagon method. Now, let us just get a little more real world. Let us start with a rectangle representing wood mounted on our lathe. The darker rectangle represents the turning axis and the short nubs that we will leave temporarily on the sphere. Now, measure the diameter of the cylinder. Transfer that measure to the face of the cylinder. These represent the top and the bottom of the cylinder that contains our sphere. Next, we need to start cutting corners. We know the line is a 45 degree angle, but where to start the cut is the question. We need points that we can mark on the cylinder. Myself and others have done the math multiple ways, so you don't need to. All you need to know is that from the corner of the cylinder to the start of our cut is 0.293 times the diameter. While we are at it, we need to know the size of the side of the octagon. Our math discovers this to be 0.414 times the diameter. Every sphere, every time. The ratios do not change. We can mark the corresponding points on the top, bottom, and sides of the cylinder. Once we cut the corners, we have an octagon. Our circle, or sphere, is still there inside the wood. We need to cut some more corners, but how? We will mark the middle of each flat or side. The top and bottom marks are still embedded inside the wood and spindle nubs. We cannot mark them. We have to imagine them there. Then split each of these new flats in half again. In effect, each side of the octagon has been split into quarters. The next set of corners to cut are between the red lines. We now have a 16-sided polygon, a hexadecagon. No, we do not need to rename the process. Octagon method will suffice. Our circle is still inside the hexadecagon with a few more corners to cut. For smaller spheres, this is far enough. 
If you're turning a larger sphere, you may want to divide the side yet again for a 32-sided polygon, a tricontadigon. Refining by eye is enough at this point. Optionally, there are many supplemental sphere shaping techniques, but for most of us, this is enough when coupled with the next process. We also still have the spindle nubs to get rid of. The next sub-process uses a cup center, while we refine the sphere to get rid of the nubs and to be a perfect sphere. There are many options for a cup center. Metal is overkill for wood turners. Scraps of wood can be mounted to a chuck or a faceplate. My preference is to integrate a threaded faceplate with the cup center, but making threaded faceplates is a another topic for another time. We also need something to hold the sphere to the cup center. This can be another faceplate mounted to the live center. My favorite is a rubber stopper drilled out to fit my live center. If you are desperate, a thin, small scrap of wood to prevent the point from digging in could work. Enough talk of sphere theory. Let us go to the lathe and turn a sphere the wise way. No expensive jig required. I have prepared a piece of dry plum with a lot of burl type grain. The plum seems to be very hard and very dry. I have turned it down to a point where the length is greater than the diameter. It is still mounted between centers. My first task from this point is to trim the end near the headstock. The drive has bored into the wood. I want to cut it back enough that the damage will not be in the final sphere. Now I can measure the diameter. I write that number on my wood turner's notepad, the wood in my lathe. Next, mark that same measure as the length of the cylinder. Then, trim back the end at the tailstock. This is a peeling cut with my skew, which works despite the tough wood that seems to be inconsistent. Now a short break to complete the minimal math. The diameter times 0.293 for the distance from top to corner and 0.414 times the diameter for the length of the side of the octagon. Then make these marks on the side of the cylinder and the ends of the cylinder. I've decided to never again press points against spinning wood. I make a trial mark, then measure and try again. A much safer procedure. That math was not bad at all. Everyone with a smartphone has a calculator. I also keep these key measures in a note on my phone. Now for those 45 degree cuts to cut the first corners. The hardest part is to pay attention to starting the cut with the gouge flute closed. Then gradually work it down, evenly reducing the distance from the cut to the target marks on the side and end of the cylinder. Do not worry about being exact. This process is largely self-correcting. I am also trimming back the nubs just a little, not too much, I'm not ready to dismount the wood yet. Next to divide each exposed side into quarters. This marks the next set of corners to cut and how much from line to line. Now to cut more, some more corners from line to line. These are short, small cuts. Again, get close, but do not worry about being exact. Then immediately move on to rounding off the sphere. I often get somewhat of an egg shape. No matter, the main objective is to be near round at the equator, where the mount will shift in the next step. To round, I use a gouge in a shear scrape mode. A scraper would work about as well. Just keep it in a negative rake position. My sphere still will have the nubs at the original turning axis. I could cut them off, ensuring not to cut too close, but that is a dangerous cut at the bandsaw. I should use a handsaw. Instead, I will ignore them for now and mount the wood between a cup center and a padded live center. The equator line is still showing, or else I would have to mark it again. I mount the sphere with the old equator running from pole to pole. Then nibble off the nubs while monitoring the ghost image at the top of the sphere. I want the ghost to go away, but not to cut too much into the old equator line. The old equator line was a circle. 
The more I interrupt it, the more I may have to do later. Again, perfection at this point is a fallacy. We only want to be close. A scraper would work as well as my gouge in shear scraping mode. The last thing to do before moving on is to mark the new equator line. Then loosen the sphere and rotate it so that the new equator line runs from pole to pole. Again, I am working to reduce the ghost image and leave that equator line intact if possible. The ghost image is much smaller now. Gentle cuts are the name of the game. A deep catch would mean additional rotational remounts. The last thing to do before moving on is to mark a new equator line. Again, rotate so that the new equator runs from pole to pole. The ghost should be getting much smaller now and hopefully barely disappearing. I am being very gentle with my tool. Overcutting is not a disaster. It only means more work and a smaller sphere. I have switched to my skew as a negative rake scraper. This is hard burl wood. The surface will not be perfect, but the sphere will be round, a sphere. My sphere is not perfect, but will be shortly. I am changing my tool again, this time to an 80 grit sandpaper. Do not skip to a higher grit. 80 grit is a great shaping tool to remove any remaining ridges on the sphere. I like to cup the sandpaper to the shape of the sphere. Before, when I was using my gouge, I changed the mount three times. Each mount leaves a little bit at the poles. It is the same now with the sandpaper. I remount and reposition the sphere at least three times. Actually, at the 80 grit stage, it is often worth going an extra remount or two to really perfect the sphere. Then after this, the sphere is as perfect as it can be. The only part left is to work up through the grits of the sandpaper. Three remounts are required at each grit to cover the entire sphere. I do not mark the equator while sanding, but I am imagining the new equator line and moving it to be from pole to pole at each remount. If I had used a sphere jig, I would be sanding this same way. Depending on the jig, I would also have to have dealt with the nubs at the original turning axis somehow. Cup centers are required for most jigs. The last thing to do is to apply a finish of choice. For this sphere, I am using a paper towel saturated with my mixture of beeswax and mineral oil. Just like in each step before, I am applying it with three axis rotations. Then rub it out with a fresh paper towel. And you guessed it, rubbing it out in three axis rotations. Now that we can turn a sphere easily and quickly, it opens the door to many other projects where we want to start, at least, with a perfect sphere. Now, this sphere at about uh, two and a half inches in diameter took me less than 27 minutes in this video. For those of you who love your sphere jigs, can you do a two and a half inch sphere in 27 minutes or less? That's the challenge. For those who do not have a sphere jig, have a crack at it using this method, the octagon method, and tell me how you did, But because it is adaptable to anyone. So I will call this the spheres for the wise wood turners. <laughs>